Earthlings, and welcome along to another time tunnel. It used to be called Roger's time tunnel. I think I might call it Roger and Rouge's time tunnel because usually this is about the time when uh, my cat companion <laughs> wakes up and usually has to have a bit of a chat in the background. So uh, I might start uh, ca calling ourselves that. So we're up to um, number five now in our new archive, the Vegan Time Tunnel. So the idea is to produce an archive of some historical moments in the animal advocacy movement. And it will be a kind of permanent record there for people to look through because it's important to know the movement, the history of the movement that, that you join. It's a very, very important thing. Um, in fact, uh, we've, we've already got five um, little videos. Uh, because the one, the first one is an intro, and I actually talked about Faye Funnel in that, and she, she um, was one of the people who burnt a fur coat. She she kind of queued outside, I think it was Harrods in London, uh, bought a fur coat which was really, really reduced, and then promptly went out and and burnt it uh, as a kind of publicity thing. And then the first one proper is the anti-vivisection movement in Britain. So that's number one. You can find all these on my YouTube channel. And if you're uh, not on my YouTube channel but watching this now, that's the best place to be for the chat uh, as well. So all of all of this archive, if you look, go to playlist uh, and you look for Vegan Time Tunnel, you'll find all these there. The first one was the anti reception movement in Britain. And then the second one was the groundbreaking film from 1981 called The Animals Film, which I always describe as my generation's Earthling. So that was number two. Then we had um, a famous raid on a laboratory called Operation Valentine, because it took place on Valentine's Day, um, in, again, 1982. And, um, and then the last one was the origins of the vegan social movement when the, the Vegetarian Society became pregnant with non-dairy vegetarians. And after a very, very, very long gestation period, they gave birth to <laughs> the Vegan Society um, which is, so that's an interesting kind of story. So we're back to anti uh this time, and we're also still back to, um, just change this, there you go. Uh, we're also back to um, the 80s, really. But uh, as a general point, it seems that whenever animal advocates go into, you know, or even other people, you know, like film companies go into a vivisection laboratory, they are even like just a, an animal holding unit. They end up with some pretty horrible footage, or at least potentially. So, for example, I can think of a few. I just kind of put a list together today. I was thinking of um, 1981, Huntington Life Science, which was the uh, prompted the Shack campaign. We'll probably have a time tunnel on that. We're exposed by an activist called Sarah Kite. She worked for the BYV at the time. That's a British Union for the abolition of vivisection. And so she worked undercover for a few weeks. She started off, um, I think, in the animal house, caring for rats first and then uh, dogs. In the early 1980s, I was too lazy to really find out exactly, uh, the NAL, the Northern Animal Liberation um, League, they entered the laboratories at Babraham, which was in Cambridgeshire. And that's when they found a, a ca cannula or a fistula in a cow. I think it might be one of the first times when people saw you know, that big hole that they put in the side of a cow so they can look at the digestion system, this kind of thing. 1984, we had the SEAL, which is a Southeast Animal Liberation League, and they entered the Royal College of Surgeons. And in the first one, I think, I showed you a front page, I think, from the Liberator magazine, and it had uh, a scene from that uh, raid, and it was when the vivisector had tattooed the word crap, C-R-A-P, on the forehead of a, a monkey. Then 84, we had Hazelton. I was a co-founder of this thing called the Hazelton Action Group, so we, we'll, we'll have a time to know about, about that. And uh, we entered the laboratory and got some documents out. Um, and found that they were doing experiments on rats and New Zealand white rabbits, the, the favorite uh, rabbit of choice in the vivisection industry, 
and they were um, researching on paraquat, although the toxicity of paraquat was already known. And then 1996 um, to 1997, Zoe Broughton, she filmed again in um, Hunting the Life Science, and that ended up on a Channel 4 documentary called It's a Dog's Life. And then finally, just this little rundown of, of the history of these kind of exposés, 2021 in Madrid, a Madrid-based contract research organization, which is called uh, Vivo Technia, conducted experiments on a wide range of other animals, including monkeys, dogs, mini pigs. Mini pigs have be, seem to have become quite popular with vivisectors in recent years, rats, mice, and rabbits. And um, that expose was um, done by Cruelty Free International, which is the new name for uh, the BYV. Okay, so moving on to what we're going to do today then. Uh, the time frame for this time tunnel is the early 80s, and but this time it's in North America. It's again an expose of a vivisection lab or the vivisection industry, whatever you want to say, but it's got an unusual uh, twist to it. In terms of the context to all of this, because we're looking uh, in particular at 1983 to 1985. The context is that Tom Reagan had just published The Case for Animal Rights, which is a groundbreaking rights-based text. So basically, we talked about the origins of rights-based animal rights uh, there. Uh, Gary Francione, a legal scholar, we'll meet him later in the story, uh, was still in the animal movement. Uh, he's since left and formed a counter movement. Uh, he was working at the time for a small, young radical group uh, by the name of People for the Ethical Treatment of uh, Animals. Uh, the ALF, the Animal Liberation Front, was arguably at the peak of its powers uh, in the 1980s. So it was kind of like all happening, if you like. And in terms of the story for today, the ALF and Peter play a huge uh, role. Okay, so in either May or June 84, and the date is disputed, different sources, the most powerful anti-vivisection film of all time, in my opinion, was stolen. Now, that sounds a bit odd, but that's the unusual twist about this particular story. The film was stolen rather than made sort of so it was we'll come back to the made part because that is part of the controversy um, about all this anyway what happened at the beginning is may june 84 the alf enter the labs of pennsylvania university they engage in some economic sabotage but most significantly they remove over 60 hours of videotape uh, from the lab in fact, there are some reports that it was a mixture of video and audio tape, but um, it was a video that we um, we ended up uh, being able to see, as it were. Now, the video, this is this is what makes this, in my view, the most powerful anti-vivisection film ever. And it probably will always be so because of this fact. The video was shot by the vivisectors, the animal experimenters. So they were filming themselves experimenting on baboons in a head injury clinic um, and it's clear from what they do on film and what they say probably even more so that this video was never meant to be seen by the public they were just filming it for their own archive if you like so without the actions of the ALF the public will never have seen the film even though they were paying for it um, and also a, a, a huge chunk according to the subsequent video that we're going to have a look, little look at a very small part of it which we talked about one million dollars uh, per year was being given to this lab oh, and that and so it ended up being something like 13 14 million dollars and in the early 80s that is a lot of money so the Armed Liberation Front give Peter the videotapes and Peter released less than 30 minutes of the 60 hours under the name Unnecessary Fuss. 
So that fact it, it creates controversy, which we will return to uh, a little later. Um, Peter tended to kind of um, spread this around all over the world when, when they edited it down. And we in Britain had uh, received a copy. And in Britain, and maybe more widely in Europe, we called it Pennsylvania primates. But the, the official title of the video from Peter was Unnecessary Fuss. It's still available on YouTube. Um, it's about 28 minutes long. It's, it's hard to watch. So the edited version that I'm going to show you I've been very careful about what I've chosen and I've kind of covered over some of the the scenes, if you like. So I've made this edit of about four minutes. Um, so it's not graphic, but there is a content warning in the sense that you will hear the audio, which is really interesting, but also the audio itself uh, kind of paints a picture, if you like. So so I will I will give you a warning again when we come to it, which is going to be uh, at the uh, towards the end, really. So what made the video pretty explosive is this disgusting attitude of the vivisectors, as well as obviously what they were doing to the other animals, but their, their actual attitude um, to them, to the other animals, was really kind of revealing. And it begs the question about, you know, to what extent does that type of thing go on now? Because uh, one thing, one thing that is definitely true is that um, is that you can guarantee that vivisectors are probably a lot more careful about what they do with the films that they film for themselves now than than they did then. Was that something about Francion? No, no, no. Um, it's not that he's against animal rights. In fact, <laughs> quite the opposite. He would say that uh, our movement, the one that you know that we're um, talking about, the animal movement, as he calls it is really an animal welfare movement. He would call us animal welfareists and that he's really the animal rights movement. And so um, rather than stay within the animal welfare movement, he he went to um, separate it out to the abolitionist approach. So he would say he's animal rights, we're animal welfare. Of course, we would uh, disagree with that, but that's the position uh, that we're in. Okay, so I'm only going to give you the barest description of the vivisection that's going on. Uh, it was a head injury clinic, and the researchers were cementing with something called dental stone the heads of baboons into helmets. And then once they were uh, in these helmets, then they were placed into a device, and that device jerked the heads of the apes uh, so fast that brain damage was uh, the likely uh, result. After that, the researchers had the job of removing the helmets, and um, and this becomes a real part of the controversy of all this. They resorted to using hammers and screwdrivers to do it, and so from a scientific point of view, uh, that probably invalidates the data. So if you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound too scientific, you would be right. In fact, the procedures in this lab throughout, uh, and also it was described as one of the best in the world, are absolutely awful. And it begs the question again, what goes on in more modern day uh, labs? I, I think some... I think some apologists or supporters of vivisection will say, well, a university lab is one thing, and that was what this was, compared with a commercial one where the standards are possibly higher. So that might be one of the points that they would make. So the research in this case in Pennsylvania was claimed to be about helping uh, humans who had suffered whiplash. So that, that, that's what they were researching on. <clears throat> and so Wikipedia says this, one sequence shows that a baboon's ear, ear had been damaged as the helmet is removed. Quote, like I left a bit of the ear behind, unquote. The footage shows researchers performing electrocautery on an inadequately sedated baboon, smoking cigarettes and pipes during surgery, laughing and playing uh, loud music. A researcher is seen holding a brain injured baboon up to the camera while another speaks to the animal. 
Quote, don't be shy now, sir. Nothing to be afraid of. While one baboon is strapped and waiting to uh, in the hydraulic device, the photographer pans to a brain damaged baboon strapped into a high chair in another corner of the room. And he says, quote, cheerleading is the corner. We have B10. B10 wishes his counterpart well. As you can see, B10 is still alive. B10 is hoping for a good uh, result. Now, that last part, which showed in the film that there was more than one uh, baboon under experimentation, uh, becomes very important in the uh, subsequent um, controversy about all this. So as you can imagine then, by the time we get to the autumn of 84, the goings on at this university had been exposed and perhaps unsurprisingly, it became big news. Now, I'm gonna just jump a little bit forward to 1985 now, and then we're gonna return um, to, to watch a little bit of the film, but also to talk about the controversy about uh, when the, the video was released. So on July the 15th, 1985, about 100 animal activists, including Professor Tom Reagan, the author of The Case for Animal Rights, occupied the office of the National Institute of Health. This is in Bethesda in Maryland in North America. The protesters demand that the government should at least suspend the funding to this research, but really they were demanding a full investigation. As usual, the police threatened immediate arrests but in the end, there was a standoff for about four days when it was a four-day occupation. So Gary Francione, the animal rights legal scholar, and he was there. In fact, he was everyone's lawyer, including Tom Reagan, really. He says that Tom Reagan essentially kept things going over this period of four days because the activists were tired, uh, they became anxious, and they also became frightened because they're under constant uh, fear of arrest and also what violence might be used um, while they were being arrested, that kind of thing. Francione reports that Reagan was a calming influence, uh, recounting to the activists the history of nonviolent protest in general in lots of different social movements. Reagan said that such uh, social movements had their place and this was exactly the same. So this kind of nonviolence resistance had its place within our movement, just as it had in others. So there is a, um, a special on Tom Reagan in a journal called Between the Species, which you can find. And Francione's got an article in that, and it's called Reflections on Tom Reagan and the Animal Rights Movement that Once Was. Now that again is an indication to why he left, because he says that it's no longer the animal rights uh, movement. He says this, quote, Tom was a terrific storyteller and his tales and his knowledge of social justice movements engaged and energized this group day after day for almost four days straight. So eventually Mar Margaret Heckler, who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services, announced the suspension of the lab's $1 million annual grant and she also did, in fact, order this full investigation, which is what uh, they really wanted. And Francione again says, quote, this sitting was undoubtedly the most significant event that had happened to date and perhaps since in the American animal rights movement. So the lab was closed down, uh, people were fired, um, and then there was some reconstruction going on um, in other words, that uh, it's quite likely that some of the vivisection would have been transferred elsewhere. They might have swapped species, which is often what they will do as a result of these kind of campaigns. Um, and so the chances are that the vivisection continues in some modified form, which, which is one of the problems about pressure campaigns. Um, so the legacy of this entire thing, in my mind, is, is the actual film. And as I said, it can still be seen on YouTube uh, in all its 28 minute uh, glory. So um, I want to then look at this kind of propaganda war that broke out after the release of the video. 
there were concerns, for example, that Peter had released only 28 minutes from 60 hours of stolen videotapes. Worse, there was a claim that Peter used clever editing techniques to show the same baboons several times, claiming that we see many baboons. So enter into the story something called the Office for Protection from Research Risks, which is OPRR. Uh, and OPRR came into existence officially in 1972. This group um, completely blasted Peter with lots of allegations of tampering with the raw video materials, distortion and lying. But the interesting thing about that when I've looked at it is that their own stance seems pretty replete with misrepresentations itself. So there was a, a kind of battle uh, going on. So I'm going to show you a document, um, which is this one. And uh, let's just zoom to the top. You'll see this is uh, reflections on the organizational locus of this OPRR. And it's written by um, someone who used to run it for many years. And he's called Charles Raymond McCarthy. And in fact, um, his little um, his little blurb says, because this was in an obituary actually, um, Charlie was OPRR's longest serving director, holding the role during the critical period of 1977 to 1993. So in other words, he was the director uh, whilst this happens, and he, he wrote this uh, report uh, about what happened with Peter. In fact, this report is full of Peter stuff. But then this is the interesting thing. He said, in that role, he was charged with protecting the rights of human subjects and promoting the welfare of laboratory animals. So right there, we can see a problem that humans are the ones with the rights and uh, any vague idea of rights for other animals is rights to welfare which is not really um, animal rights so that's an interesting one so going back to this document then just scroll down we need um end note uh 32 i think uh, it's all picked out already that's good this is um this is about blue peter for those people who are not uh, British, Blue Peter is a long-running children's uh, program. <laughs> and they used to uh, make things there and then on the screen, but they used to do some shortcuts and say, well, here's one I made earlier. So this is one that I highlighted earlier. So I'm just going to zip through the, uh, what's what's been said here, uh, because this tells us a lot about what's to come in terms of the video that I'm going to show you. <clears throat> in 1983, another case made national headlines. A group that identified themselves as the Animal Liberation Front, ALF, broke into the University of Pennsylvania head injury clinic in, uh, Pencil, uh, in Philadelphia. Equipment was smashed and files were scattered. Most importantly, approximately 60 hours of video or, uh, and audio tapes were stolen. The tapes had been used as a tool by researchers uh, by research investigators to capture visual images of research animals. Data concerning heartbeat, blood pressure, and brain wave activity. And, and this, is, this is, becomes quite um, important, this last, this last little bit. Uh, and investigators' verm, verbal observations concerning the animals involved in the research study of head injuries. The protocol called for sedated baboons to be injured in a machine that simulated uh, the whiplash motion that often inflicts damage to the neck and spine of humans involved in rear end auto crushes. The nature of the injuries to the animals were to be studied and the animals unassisted recovery from injury was to be compared with the recovery of animals that re uh, received a variety of treatment modalities. The protocol was controversial because it requires the infliction of severe injuries to the baboons. Each animal ultimately would be examined in terminal surgery. The ALF gave the stolen audio videotapes to Peter. Peter edited the tapes 
added a voiceover commentary and circulated the edited tape entitled Unnecessary Fuss to Schools, Newspapers, Congress, Television Networks, and a dozen and dozens of television stations. Congress and members of the general public were shocked at the cruelty to and disregard for the research animals presented on the tape. Peter then petitioned the PHS, I'm not quite sure what that is, <clears throat> I thought it meant Pennsylvania Health Service, but it doesn't, um, to close the labs and to punish the investigators, doctors Langfit and Generelli, for violations of the PHS policy. OPRR refused to act on the basis of evidence contained in an edited tape. The University of Pennsylvania claimed that unnecessary fuss was a caricature of the actual proceedings that had taken place in the laboratory. Peter refused for more than a year to turn over the evidence it had to the OPRR. In the spring of 1984, Peter sent the unedited tapes to the USDA, which in turn sent them to the OPRR, the, uh, the group that this guy uh, works for. OPRR asked 18 veterinarians, mostly diplomats of, yeah, diplomats of the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine, who were, for the most part, employed in various institutes within NIH to review the tapes and report on their findings concerning violations of the PHS policy or the American uh, or the Animal Welfare Act. <clears throat> In the meantime, OPRR conducted several site visits to the Head Injury Laboratory. On the last of these site visits, Dr. Generali performed a surgical procedure in the presence of the visitors, which he claimed was typical of those involved in the study. OPRR were, was astonished to learn <coughs> that aseptic technique was sloppy, that smoking was allowed in the operating theater, improper on many grounds and dangerous procedure when oxygen, oxygen tanks were stored and used, and that the depth of induced anesthetic coma in the animals was questionable. OPRR also learned that most of the animals were not seen by the attending veterinarian either prior to <clears throat> or after suffering whiplash. And final um, paragraph, OPRR discovered that the unnecessary fuss presented the, the case history of only one of the approximately 150 animals that had been, that had received whiplash. By clever edit, editing and inaccurate voiceover comments, the viewer was led to believe that the inhumane treatment um, depicted on the film was repeated over and over and over again. In actual fact, one baboon was badly treated and the film showed that single mistreatment over and over again, while the commentary or the commentator narrated uh, that the mistreatment was repeated over a long series of different animals. In all, OPRR identified about 25 errors in the description of what was taking part. Typical was the statement accompanying the film showing an accidental water spill uh, that acid had been uh, carelessly poured on a baboon. <clears throat> okay, so that's. Um, that's a fairly uh, damaging um, attack on, on Peter, uh, if you like. So I'm just going to show you now the my edits. And once again, um, a bit of a content warning. I've taken out all the graphic imagery, so you shouldn't see much, but you will hear them talking. Now, this is what to look out for. First of all, you see the title. Then you see a statement by this um, researcher generally, the kind of leader of the pack, if you like. Um, <clears throat> this is where the title came from because he talked about unnecess unnecessary fuss. Then we hear an, an intro by Ingrid Newkirk. Um, in fact, she, she mentions rock music 
I, I, so rock music does appear in the full full film, but I've edited it out. So even though it mentions rock music, you don't you don't hear it, but it, it is there. Um, sloppy practices uh, leading to injuries. So this is the controversy about whether um, acid was spilt um, or not. Then you've got Dr. Torg, and he's talking about how easy it is to damage a brain. And this is where you get the, um, the issue about the hammer and screwdriver being used. <clears throat> so you've got Newt Newkirk talking uh, about that. The fact that it was not sterile was an issue, that smoking uh, was involved, as it said in that report, violations of regulations and the law. Researchers then called uh, an injured baboon a sucker. And then Langfitt, uh, in a press statement uh, about laughing, said that you know the researchers wouldn't laugh at the apes. And then this is totally contradicted by, by the film. One of the vivisectors called one of the uh, baboons a punk. And um, <clears throat> there's a little bit of um, flirting going on, really, between... Uh, the guys and a female research technician, I think. Uh, and the real problem here was that she was holding the baboon, but he was brain damaged. And so his head kept tilting back. And so she was cracking jokes about he wanted a kiss and this kind, this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> as a general matter, in terms of, of Peter, you'll see that there's a lot of emphasis on the fact that they broke laws and regulations. So you start to see how Peter kind of... Um, uh, move towards the kind of animal welfare stance, even even as early as 85, which is quite interesting uh, in that. So those are the things that you're about, to, as it were, to see. So let's see if we can get on with it. In the next few minutes, you will see practices defended by the University of Pennsylvania, where experimenters inflict repeated head injuries in baboons. What you are about to see and hear is all footage the animal researchers took themselves. It offers only a glimpse of what the taxpayer pays for but is never allowed to see. Aside from my voice, the voices you will hear belong to the experimenters themselves. The rock music is theirs. Why don't you put him in the fucking goddamn I'm working cage? On it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I don't, I'm trying to get... Would you cut this? I'm trying to cut this damn thing. What was it? This federally funded head injury clinic receives approximately one million tax dollars every year and is now in its 13th year. Some animals receive up to 160 hammer blows at a time, yet the delivery of these extra blows is not revealed in the researchers' grant applications. In violation of the NIH guide, experimenters in this laboratory repeatedly fail to perform sterile surgery. Although this researcher is wearing gloves, the surgery can in no way be considered sterile as no mask, gown, cap, or surgical drapes are used, and the researcher not only rests his surgical instrument on the baboon's unshaven chest, but places the instrument back in the baboon's head after he drops it to the floor. Again in violation of the NIH guide, these experimenters smoke continually at the operating table. These experimenters are also violating Pennsylvania state law which prohibits smoking in the vicinity of bottled oxygen and nitrous oxide, both highly dangerous gases in use in this room. While the experimenter on the far side of the table lights up a cigarette, the student working on the monkey comments that he has three months to learn neurosurgery. Good job. You gotta stop beating boards. Huh? You gotta stop beating boards. Jeez. You gotta learn all this shit all over again. Oh, have some axonal damage though, monkey, else we're wasting 500 hours worth of HRP on you, you sucker. Okay. Doesn't look the least 
There she goes. There she goes. She's on TV. Oh my God. Holding her monkey. Look, yeah. Go, go. It's like a cat. Kitty, 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 kitty. Look at the, look at the cat commercial. Say over here. Say cheese. Looks like she's gonna fall in. You better hook the, the uh, yeah. anti-vivisection yeah. people don't get a hold of this film. The hell? Anti-vivisection people, they got a nice shot of you. Why don't you look they got forward. Larry's name look in the picture. And Okay, so those um, bits there are about um, the only kind of fairly non-graphic parts of the film that um, I extracted out for, for this purpose. Um, just wanted to go back to a couple of things that, um, that was said in that report. Um, for example, um, typical was the statement accompanying um, the film showing an accidental water spill that acid had been carelessly uh, poured on a baboon. Uh, I read that out before, badly. I've always been terrible at reading out loud. Um, what Newkirk actually says in the film is that poor handling results in a fluid, perhaps acid, being spilt on an animal. So whether um, whether you think that that was totally misleading, and, and um, I suppose it puts into the viewer the mind that it could have been acid, um, but then again, we are talking about a laboratory here, so uh, there is that. Um, also, he says that in all, OPRR identify about 25 errors in the description of uh, what was taking place. Now, I'm not actually quite sure that there, there's enough narration for that to even um, taken place, really. So uh, that's one issue, um, as it were, in defense of... Um, of Newkirk and, and, and Peter. And then finally on this, um, it said um, that the idea was to capture visual images of research animals, data concerning heartbeat, blood pressure, and brain wave activity, and investigated verbal observations concerning the animals involved, blah, blah, blah. So again, I'll let you decide whether, whether what was going on there was just simply the investigators' verbal ob observations um, about what was going on um, in terms of the uh, the research. Th there's quite a lot of really weird stuff going on. Um, for example, uh, researchers lifting uh, baboons or a baboon um, by the arms and then later saying that he thinks that the baboon has likely got a shoulder dislocation. So there's a lot of kind of weird, very unscientific stuff uh, going on. Oh, and BC, PHS, uh, Public Health Services. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Either way, it's bad lab practice to have uh, unlabeled liquid lying around the place enforcing the argument that um, a GLP uh, was not followed. The, um, yeah, the thing about that, I suppose, is that because it was off, you couldn't actually see what was going on. It could have been a tap rather than a bottle um, of liquid. So, that, but again, see, this is, this is where you get into the interesting kind of welfare rights thing. Because the one worrying part of a necessary self um, fuss is the fact that there is a suggestion that um, it wouldn't be so bad if all the regulations of the laws were being upheld. 
This is the same problem that we have in the movement at the moment when activists concentrate on things like whether a particular farm is living up to its high welfare standards. Uh, obviously, from an animal rights point of view, it's totally irrelevant whether they do or they don't, because um, as I said at the beginning, whenever people have gone into a laboratory, they find ho horrible things going on. But one thing you can guarantee in every laboratory is that you'll find routine and systematic animal rights violations. So <clears throat> the actual nitty gritty, as it were, is is not such a problem as the fact that they've been used. And uh, but that's a dilemma for the interview section uh, movement in the sense that um, if you just say, well, you know, we're totally opposed to animal use and uh, you, you probably haven't really got a film then. So you've, you've got to go through what, what's happening and that inev inevitably you end, you end up talking about the treatment rather than the use. And that's where I think the public can get quite confused about what's going on and also about what we want. As abolitionists, we just want no animal use. But when we keep talking about treatment, and in particular, how some farms or laboratories are not living up to the standards that they're supposed to, then that puts the focus on treatment, and then that puts the focus on reform, and then that puts the focus on welfare. And that's always the, the kind of danger with these things. Um, right, have we got any more before we um, split? <laughs> um, so that was unnecessary fuss, Pennsylvania primates. Um, and to answer the question in the title, who made the most powerful section film ever? It was the vivisectors. And that's why I always say that, well, we're never really going to get, um, we're never really going to get another film as powerful as that. I mean, there are some really powerful section films like um, Hidden Crimes, which was produced by the Hans Reusch people. <clears throat> Bernie V, hi. This horrific video made me an anti section activist. We need more vegans and animal rights activists to, to uh, participate in anti section protests. Yes, well, obviously, um, that's part of what's going on in terms of the movement right now, is that there is a lot more. Uh, um, some of the, the old-time um, long-term unsaboteurs and anti-vivisectionists, you know, like um, uh, John Kurt and Mel Broughton, those, those kind of people, they did suggest that vivisection had become like a forgotten issue. And, and funny enough, it, it was COVID that brought it back um, in that sense, because suddenly we had all the kind of debate about how uh, the vaccines was produced and then people then started talking about animal experimentation uh, again whereas generally speaking the movement had gone rather silent on on vivisection and concentrated much more see i don't know whether i mean is there any of the those kind of films that that vegans recommend um in the in the last few years you know dominion earthlings land of hope and glory these, these are, as far as I know, there's no vivisection in any of those, right? And so I'm not quite sure whether there would be, you know, is there, is there a modern day anti vivisection uh, film that has been produced by the movement uh, recently? There was a lot of vivisection in the animals film, but there wasn't any, I don't think, in Earthlings and Dominion, Land of Hope and Glory, all, all the kind of um, videos that we tend to recommend to non vegans in terms of go vegan, right? John Hopkins, our experiments more recently, uh, as in an expose or, or of or a film of. Yeah, Joanne is reminding people um, about the um, the ongoing controversy, which seems to be being resolved almost, well, slightly at least. Um, it does seem that um, I heard a report that Apple have now suggested that there are no animal um, products in their devices. And one argument there is the fact that it would have to have some kind of health and safety um, warning about allergies uh, on the packaging if it was the case that if you take apart your device, you could come in contact with something that was toxic to you, that you that you had an allergy to. So that, that's one um, suggestion. So, but there might there might be a difference between um, Apple and the other other groups, you know, 
androids and <laughs> I, um, I'm not quite sure what they're, what they're all called, but um, it does seem now that um, we, we are getting to the stage where it looks like that particular um, club that uh, non-vegans use to beat um, vegans with is rather um, diminishing. And some, some interesting news about the crop death scenario as well is the fact that um, well, I'm, I'm waiting on, on an audio of uh, an exchange where um, some farmers are starting to object to people kind of castigating vegans for causing the deaths of trillions of other animals because the farmers are saying, well, they're accusing us of that as well because we're the ones who are doing that killing as well as the other killing. So it's not the vegans. And so it, it's quite an interesting kind of development, this. So it's just kind of seemed to be happening right now. And so that's going to be um, news for the future, I think. Right, people, thank you so much for tuning in. And um, we shall be back uh, next week with another vegan time tunnel. So thanks a lot for tuning in. Thank you.